Welcome to Whiskey Cast, cask strength conversation featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 834 for August 30th, 2020. Coming up in a few minutes. We've been very fortunate that for the time that the bourbon industry has existed, there's been this tremendous oak resource. But I don't think there's any guarantee that it will continue in the future unless we learn to do a much better job of managing oak hickory forests. Earlier this month, forestry scientist and author Tom Kimmerer joined us on our Whiskey Wednesday webcast to answer your questions about the white oak trees that become the barrels that give the whiskeys we enjoy their character. We had so much response to that webcast that I decided to bring Tom back for a separate interview to discuss not only why white oak is perfect for maturing whiskeys, but how we preserve that resource for future generations. Our conversation is coming up later on Whiskey Cast in Depth, along with the What I'm Tasting This Week department, behind the label, and... I can tell you one thing, it hasn't felt like five years. It's flown by. The news is next on this episode of Whiskey Cast. When you land on something special, you just know. Redbreast, the quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey and a proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Let's get started with the news. There's been a setback in trade talks between the U.S. and the European Union. EU Trade Commissioner Phil Hogan of Ireland has stepped down. He's the latest political casualty of a controversial golf dinner in Galway, Ireland this month that violated the country's strict COVID-19 health guidelines. Hogan's violations were more extreme than most since he traveled from Brussels to Ireland without completing the mandatory 14 days of self-isolation before the outing. And he visited County Kildare three times, even though that county is in a local lockdown because of an increase in pandemic cases. As Trade Commissioner, Hogan has been leading the EU's team, negotiating with the U.S. over the aircraft subsidy fight and other trade issues that have led to tariffs by both sides on whiskey imports. No word yet on which European Commission representative will take over the trade portfolio. Ireland has yet to name a new representative to the Commission. That dinner has also led to the resignation of Irish Agriculture Minister Dara Caleri. That's important because Irish whiskey is part of the Agriculture Minister's portfolio. Meanwhile, Ireland remains the only country in Europe where pubs remain closed nationwide, and that will not be changing anytime soon. The most recent plan was to allow pubs to open starting Monday, but government officials have now pushed that back once again, with no new target date set. While pubs that do serve food were allowed to reopen at the end of June, those that only serve drinks have remained closed. The Irish government is proposing a 16 million euro support package for pub owners, but the two main organizations that represent pub operators call that, quote, crumbs. It would be worth around 4,000 euros to the average pub owner. One other coronavirus-related note, Edrington has now announced that the McAllen Distillery will reopen to visitors on September 26th. With strict social distancing guidelines in place, the visitor center will only be open on weekends for now, with advance reservations required. While I'll have more details on event changes in just a few minutes, there is one that we need to mention in the news. Whiskey Live Beirut this October has been canceled, and while part of that is because of the COVID-19 pandemic, the principal reason is the massive explosion earlier this month in Beirut's port that caused extensive casualties and damage citywide. The venue for Whiskey Live Beirut, the Seaside Pavilion, is located within half a mile of the explosion site. The pavilion's ownership group also promotes Whiskey Live Beirut and told us in an email this week that the building will require large-scale repairs before it can reopen for events. 
They do plan to hold Whiskey Live Beirut again in October of 2021. Let's talk about new distillery projects now. You may know Claremont, Kentucky as the home of the Jim Beam Distillery, but the Bullitt County town is going to get a new distillery. Plans have been announced for a new distillery next to the county fairgrounds. The Claremont Distilling Company will break ground on the project next spring. It's located at the Interstate 65 exit for Kentucky 245. That's the road that connects the interstate to Bardstown. Now, as you get closer to Bardstown, heading east on 245, you'll probably not even notice passing by the town of Deetsville, since it's located about half a mile or so back from the highway. There are also plans to revive the old T.W. Samuels distillery in Deetsville. It hasn't been used for making whiskey since 1952, but the warehouses there are still used by Heaven Hill and Maker's Mark. And yes, T.W. Samuels is an ancestor of the Samuels family of Maker's Mark fame. They're not involved with this project, though. It's being led by Georgia-based developer Rick Puig, who hopes to have the site open for restoration tours soon. We hope to have more on this story on an upcoming episode. Another stop on 245 between I-65 and Bardstown is the Four Roses Maturation and Bottling Complex in Cox's Creek. The gift shop there remains closed because of the pandemic, but the team there has been busy preparing this year's Four Roses Limited Edition Small Batch Bourbon. Master distiller Brent Elliott blended together four of the distillery's ten recipes, ranging from 12 to 19 years old, for this year's edition. He explained it on a Zoom call with reporters this week. As I was sampling the batches and narrowing it down to batches to create this one, uh, one thing that really stood out was every one of these batches that ended up going into this this formula, each batch was really robust, complex, and and elegant enough that any one of these could have stood alone as a single barrel. So it was a little challenging to bring all those together. And when I say that, it's like each one of these batches had characteristics that I didn't want to mute out. I didn't want to lose in the characteristics of any of, the, uh, any of these. With one exception, the 19-year-old was a little bit on the oaky side, uh, just because it's 19 years old. You can't really help it once you get that far out in age. So the challenge there was to not mute any of the, the uh, nuanced, um, complex characteristics of the other batches and to keep the, the good characteristics of the 19 year old, but kind of mute out that oak just a little bit or use just enough to come in to help give it that um, that nice, elegant, oaky background that I think we really achieved with this one. Brent Elliott is celebrating his fifth anniversary as Master Blender this year after taking over following the retirement of Jim Rutledge in 2015. I can tell you one thing, it hasn't felt like five years. It's flown by. You know, it seems like, and this is always the case at Four Roses, we're, we're always um, growing so rapidly, trying to keep up with demand. And really, it feels like the last five years are one big blur of trying to, um, trying to expand, trying to make sure that the quality is, is still the, is not any risk whatsoever as we add a new still, extra fermenters, uh, increase our bottling line capacity. And we're just expanding everywhere. This year's limited edition small batch will go on sale in late September for around $150 a bottle. Unlike previous years, there will not be a public sale at the Four Roses Distillery in Lawrenceburg, Kentucky. Even though the gift shop there is open, they don't want a crowd of people lining up for the annual release. There's a public lottery available now at the distillery's website, and those who are selected at random will be able to schedule an appointment to pick up their bottle. I received a sample of the limited edition small batch this week. I'll have my tasting notes for it soon at the WhiskeyCast website. Diageo is celebrating the 85th anniversary of the historic Stitzel Weller Distillery in Louisville with a re-release of Blade and Bow 22-year-old bourbon. The blend includes some of the final bourbon distilled at Stitzel Weller before it closed in 1992. 
It'll be available in 11 U.S. states and the District of Columbia. There's no word on pricing. Meanwhile, Diageo unveiled the 2020 series of its special release single malt scotches. This year's highlight is what may well be the first ever Talisker single malt finished in Caribbean rum casks. It's an 8-year-old cask strength bottling that will have a recommended U.S. retail price of $119 a bottle. There are also 30-year-old releases from Pittyvake and Dalwini, a 21-year-old Mortlock, a 20-year-old Craganmore, a 17-year-old Singleton of Dufton, the annual Lagavulin 12-year-old, and an 11-year-old Cardew. Also out of Scotland, Ardbeg is out with its second annual release of Trayvon, its 19-year-old single malt that's matured in a combination of ex-bourbon and Oloroso sherry casks. Each annual release is signed by a different Ardbeg staffer. This year's bottles are signed by longtime Visitors Center Manager Jackie Thompson. It'll carry a recommended retail price of around $300 a bottle. Douglas Lang & Company has added two new whiskeys to its remarkable regional malts range, the Epicurean 12-year-old Lowlands Blended Malt and a 12-year-old Big Pete Isla Blended Malt. Both will be permanent additions to the lineup, with recommended retail prices of 55 pounds a bottle for a Big Pete and 50 pounds a bottle for the Epicurean. Sweden's MacMira Distillery is out with its annual autumn and winter seasonal release. Yaklika means happy hunting in Swedish, and that means more than just wildlife. It means blueberries and lingonberries this time of year. That's appropriate because most of the whiskey was aged in barrels that previously held Swedish berry wine, while the rest was aged in Swedish and American oak casks. It'll have a recommended retail price in the UK of around £60 a bottle, and will be available in other markets as well. Finally, you've heard of collector's whiskeys, like the Yamazaki 55-year-old that sold for $806,000 the other day at the Bonhams auction in Hong Kong. Now there's a collector's whiskey book coming out this October. The Impossible Collection of Whiskey the 100 most exceptional and collectible bottles, may well itself become collectible. It's written by veteran whiskey writer Clay Risen of the New York Times and is published by Ossoline, which does these really expensive high-end coffee table books. In fact, this one comes in a wooden box designed to resemble a whiskey barrel. The price tag, $9.95, as in... $995, not $9.95. Clay Risen joined us recently on our Friday night happy hour webcast and told us writing the book was a lot of fun. Basically, they asked me to come up with my list of 100 dream bottles uh, from across the world. Um, You know, obviously with the you know, a good amount of Scotch and a good amount of American, but you know, I toss. There's a good amount of Japanese. There's there's some outliers in there that are a lot of fun. But coming up with the short list of like 50 whiskeys was pretty easy. And then after that, the list grew. You know, I I had 200, and then 150, and that last 50, that last like trimming it from 150 down to 100, and then 110 to 100 was incredibly hard. You know, how do you you know, you know, which McAllen's are you going to include? Um, you know, how do you choose, you know, is it anyway, you know, uh, which Kurosawa's do you include? Like, it's just, it's that sort of almost arbitrary, you know, what goes on and what goes off, but it was a lot of fun to work on. The book comes with its own bespoke tote bag and a pair of white gloves to handle it with. No, I did not receive a review copy, but we'll have some of your comments about it later in your voice. You can keep up with the latest whiskey news all week long at whiskeycast.com. Time now for the calendar of events brought to you by Catoctin Creek Distilling. We do have more event changes to let you know about this week, 
The Whiskey Guild has now canceled its New York City Whiskey Cruise that had been set for September 17th. Whiskey Live in Canberra, Australia, September 25th and 26th, has now been canceled. The organizers tell us it's very likely that their remaining events this year in Sydney and Perth will be canceled in the next few weeks because of local health restrictions. We do have a few events that will be taking place, either in person or virtually. Fine and Rare in New York City has another outdoor whiskey tasting this Tuesday night, September 1st. Waterford Distillery in Waterford, Ireland has its first open day coming up on Saturday. Tickets are still available for the Outdoor Whiskey and Barrel Night in Paramus, New Jersey, September 16th. Druitt's in Newbury, England has an auction of rare spirits coming up on the 17th. And McTeers will have a rare whiskey auction in Glasgow, Scotland on the 25th. Forty Creek Distillery in Grimsby, Ontario will be taking its annual Whiskey Weekend online this year with virtual events on September 26th. And the Whiskey Show in London is also going virtual with a full week of online events October 2nd through the 9th. We're updating the calendar at WhiskeyCast.com as we get new details from event organizers. If you're responsible for organizing a whiskey event, please use the contact form at our website to let us know about your changes. The calendar of events is brought to you by Catoctin Creek Distilling, makers of Virginia's most awarded spirits. You'll find their Roundstone Rye at fine whiskey shops in 26 U.S. states and three continents, and online, too. Visit the Where to Buy page at CatoctinCreekDistilling.com to find a retailer near you. And please drink responsibly. The search never ends, but it's nice when you can come in for a landing, pause and explore the silky smoothness of single pot still Irish whiskey, matured in the finest bourbon and Oloroso sherry casks. Land on Redbreast, then be sure to pass it on. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Whiskey Cast in Depth is brought to you by Mortlock. It's fair to say the whiskies we enjoy wouldn't exist without trees, specifically the white oak trees that are made into the barrels that whiskies have been matured in for at least a couple of centuries and probably a long time before that. There's Kerkus alba, the American white oak, Kerkus rober, its European counterpart, and many more types of white oak species. But what makes those specific species work so well for maturing whiskey? And since it can take anywhere between 60 and 100 years for an American white oak to grow from an acorn to being ready to cut down for the coopers, how do we protect that natural resource for the future? Earlier this month, Tom Kimmerer joined us on our Whiskey Wednesday webcast. He's a forestry scientist, author, and formerly served on the faculty at the University of Kentucky. Tom is also one of the world's leading experts on American white oak, and we had such a good response from you to our webcast that I wanted to bring him back to answer those specific questions. Let's start off first of all just talking about the history of American white oak and how whiskey makers discovered that this was such a good piece of wood to use for barrels. Well, that's a really interesting question. So um, oak is the premier tree species in eastern North America. And and it's easy to say that, that uh, the United States was basically built on oak. When the first settlers came here, they used oak for everything. Yes, they used white pine, they used some other things, but oak was really the most important for buildings, for furniture, for flooring, for all kinds of things. Uh, oak was extremely abundant and properly managed, and we'll talk about that some more. It, it just grows back after you, after you fill it. Uh, so there was an abundance of resources. And at the time, of course, this is before we had cardboard boxes and such, and so uh, wood boxes and containers were used for storing things. Well, barrels were the commonly used thing in Europe going way back. And, and so the early settlers here started making barrels out of oak. 
And they very quickly realized that there were kind of two distinct kinds of oak that determined what they could use it for. Oak is a big genus of about 600 species, and it's divided into two categories, white oaks and red oaks. They're called that for more or less for differences in the color of the wood, although that's not very consistent. Uh, nevertheless, we have red and white oaks. People discovered very quickly that if they made a barrel out of white oak and filled it with a liquid, the liquid would stay there forever. If they made a barrel out of red oak and filled it with liquid, the liquid would fairly quickly uh, leak out. Uh, the pores in white oak wood are sealed uh, by things called tyloses that make it impossible for fluids to move through the wood. Well, this was important because you didn't necessarily want to store everything in white oak. If you're storing flour or nails or other things, you want that wood to breathe to some extent, to exchange uh, water vapor with the atmosphere to come into equilibrium with the local humidity. Otherwise, things like flour would spoil. And so there came to be a thriving cooperage industry. Cooperage is the art of making barrels out of wood. The thriving cooperage industry, really it was one of North America's most important early industries because everything was stored and shipped in, in, in barrels. Um, and they made two kinds of barrels. They made barrels out of red oak, the red oak group, not necessarily just northern red oak. They made what was called slack cooperage. That was to store dry goods. Then they made tight cooperage for storing liquids. Well, there are a lot of different stories about how uh, distillers in Kentucky started to realize that there was some benefit to using white oak barrels for storing their liquor. One of the stories, and, and to be honest, we really don't know the exact history of how barrels invented bourbon. You know, when you come right down to it, I'm sure we'll talk about this some more, a, a, a bourbon is simply white oak extract, uh, you know, 60 to 75% of the flavor and, and all of the color of bourbon comes from uh, extractives from the wood. And we'll talk some more about that chemistry in a bit. But one of the stories is that uh, farmers in this area were raising corn there were no good trade routes from here back to the East Coast because you had to go through the mountains. And so the trade routes very quickly established going up and down the Ohio and Mississippi rivers, mostly down. Well, corn is kind of a low-density material. So you load up a barge with corn to ship it to New York, let's say, and that's not very much corn. And by the time it gets there, it's gotten wet and it's probably rot. So they started distilling it and making uh, uh, alcohol out of it and filling barrels. And then the barrels would be uh, taken up to the Ohio River and put on, um, put on barges and floated down the Ohio, floated down the Mississippi to New Orleans, put on ships, taken all the way around to New York, which, you know, the major markets on the East Coast. Well, by the time it got there, a couple of years had gone by, and the uh, alcohol and water in the barrel had time to extract all the color and flavor from the barrel, and voila, what arrived in, uh, in New York was bourbon. Now, there are other versions of the stories that it was, that it was New Orleans where it first came to be, um, and there are a variety of things, but it, it's pretty clear to me that it was uh, more or less an accidental discovery. But why does... White oak works so well. I know you explained to the tyloses, but uh, why does white oak just seem to be perfect for storing liquids? I think they started using white oak initially because it was so abundant. And again, I'm not talking just talking about there's there's a white oak species, Quercus alba, and then there's the white oak group, which incurs, uh, it includes a number of other important trees like chinkapin oak. But the white oaks were so abundant that they were easy to get. The wood is remarkably easy to work. It dries well. It takes a char well. Uh, an oak barrel can last practically forever. So from a material standpoint, it was an easy stuff to work with. But where they got lucky is it turns out that the chemicals in white oak are perfect for making bourbon. Had they started off using, let's say, uh, walnut, which was very abundant in this, in this part of the country, there would be no bourbon industry because a long-term walnut extract is 
completely undrinkable. I've actually had it. It's completely undrinkable. Pine would not have worked, although ouzo, of course, is the, the, the Greek liqueur. Ouzo is aged in, in uh, uh, pine, pine barrels. Uh, maple, you can age alcohol in maple, but the flavor extracts are not nearly as complex and interesting as they are in oak. So I think what happened was there was a sort of lucky confluence of two things. The great abundance of oak and this amazing and interesting chemistry of the wood that led to bourbon. And it really was just a matter of luck. As far as anybody can tell, you know, as you know, the history of, of bourbon is quite murky, but those are the best... Um, those are the best stories I've been able to suss out of what historical records there are. How sustainable is this? You talk about how quickly it grows and grows back after the trees are felled. It seems that we have almost as much as we did back then, even uh, though we've had significant population growth and expansion in cities building up. It doesn't seem like we've lost a lot of oak forests. Uh, we've actually gained oak forests. <laughs> um I can tell you that, uh, you know, th there was a lot of agriculture in this region. I'm in central Kentucky, so I'm in the bluegrass. In this region, and I'm particularly now talking about Appalachia, there was a tremendous uh, surge in farming, uh, mostly small farms, mostly poor farmers, uh, mostly not very skilled farmers, and they worked the soil to death. And this was throughout true throughout much of the East. In 1920... Kentucky was about 19% forest. Only 19% of the state was covered in forest. Well, those poor farmers eventually left. They worked the soil to death. They left for, for you know, they went to the cities as, at the start of the Industrial Revolution. They moved west to, to go into larger farming. Um, and so all this farmland was abandoned. And as a result, today, Kentucky has gone in a remarkably short period of time, 100 years, from being 19% forested to being 50% forested. And a lot of that came up in what foresters call oak hickory forests. And, and as the name implies, these are forests that are dominated by various species of oak and various species of hickory. Now, oak is a kind of an odd tree in terms of what it likes. Um, it likes a lot of sun. If you were to go into an oak forest, an oak hickory forest in eastern Kentucky or in the Ozarks right now, um, and you'd find all these beautiful oak trees and all these beautiful hickory trees, but on the forest floor, you'd find maples. You wouldn't find oaks and hickories because oaks and hickories need a certain amount of sunlight to, to regenerate. And this is actually turning out to be a challenge for forestry because the huge abundance of oak is a historical artifact of the abandonment of farmland. Uh, we don't really know what was here in terms of what species predominated uh, before European settlement. But if you leave these oak hickory forests alone, eventually they become beech birch maple forests. And so you would lose the resource if we did not harvest oak hickory forests. The problem, the challenge has been if we harvest oak hickory forests the wrong way, we don't get oak and hickory back. One technique of harvesting is what's called single tree selection. You go in and take out the trees that you want. That's pretty well guaranteed to regenerate a forest of beech birch maple. If you completely clear cut over very, very large patches, you also don't get oak and hickory back. You get oak and hickory if you do some kinds of intermediate treatments. Uh, they go by the names of shelter wood and seed tree that are actually quite difficult. So to give the short answer to your question of sustainability, We've been very fortunate that for the time that the bourbon industry has existed, there's been this tremendous oak resource. But I don't think there's any guarantee that it will continue in the future unless we learn to do a much better job of managing oak hickory forests. What do we need to do now to make sure that we still have oak and hickory forests 100 years from now? We need to invest in, in really good forest management. And, and that's not being done. Uh, what I mean by that is uh, we've got, you know, a number of land grant universities like the University of Kentucky, uh, like Purdue University, uh, like uh, Penn State University are doing a lot of research on how to effectively uh, regenerate oak. And we're starting to get there. We're not quite there yet. So we need to put more money into research and demonstration development. We need to put more money into high quality logging and forest management. 
It's one thing to say, this is how we're going to manage our forests. But if you've got logging contractors that are going into the woods and just taking everything they can get, then that's not going to work. We have in Kentucky, and I think most states have it now, a master loggers program, which uh, logging contractors are required to, to pass that teaches them some of the principles of good forestry. Now, I could give you a hundred examples of forests that are well managed, that are logged for oak and hickory, that are coming back in oak and hickory, that are doing exactly what we want them to do. But those examples are mostly relatively small. We have another big problem. And this problem, I think, is is really going to be devilish. And that is the land ownership problem. Let's go back to Appalachia. The same thing can be true of the Ozarks. Let's go back to Appalachia. So your your grandfather had a big piece of property, you know, had 400 acres, which would have been a big farm in, in the 19th century, in, uh, in e- even in the early 20th century. Well, he passes on, and the five kids in the family inherit the property and divide it up. And three of them move to Chicago, and one of them works in Los Angeles, and one of them works in Lexington. They own this property, but they don't really go there, and they don't really use it much. This fragmented ownership pattern is bedeviling the forest products industry because even just finding the landowner to get permission to log is difficult. A lot of uh, lay landowners, let's say, again, fellows living in Chicago and owns 100 acres in eastern Kentucky, and somebody contacts him about logging, he goes, logging? No, I want the woods. There's this uh, sense that people have that logging destroys forests, which is absolutely not true. So this land ownership pattern is a real, real problem. And I don't think there's any simple solutions except to say that I think that companies interested in sustainable uh, oak management are going to have to start aggregating land. They're going to have to start buying land. And buying out all these little small owners. Yeah, yeah. And that has not been the case up to now. Now, there are some very good timber management companies that will do that work of either buying up the land or, you know, visiting with the landowners and and convincing them to allow some logging and forest management to be done. Um, And there are good investment opportunities um, in real estate investment trusts and and other uh, timber investment trusts and other instruments whereby uh, larger companies can kind of aggregate land either in ownership or in management and be able to produce adequate timber. But I, I think that these are problems that a lot more energy and money needs to be spent to solve. Is this a case where some of the distilleries might want to start buying up land just for the forests so they can ensure themselves a supply of wood? Yeah, I'm not an economist, um, but uh, I, I would say that makes a lot of sense. Or or the alternative would be to establish uh, real estate companies that would aggregate land on behalf of the distilleries. Um, I, I think, I, I will tell you that when I was on the faculty at the University of Kentucky, and I've lived in central Kentucky for 38 years, I beat my head against the wall for several decades trying to persuade the bourbon industry that they needed to start looking forward to a time when they would run out of the resource. And they just thought it was infinite and they didn't really care. <laughs> uh, now they're all of a sudden starting to care. Um, and I think they're no offense to the people in that industry or the people in the universities. I think they're largely going about it the wrong way. Um, a number of uh, distilleries are talking about planting trees. Um, now, if I were uh, a, a distillery in Ireland where there's a, you know, where the forests were completely stripped a thousand years ago and I wanted barrels, I'd be planting trees. But in Kentucky and in the, in, in, in the Ozarks, in these hardwood forests of the East, they are self-regenerating. We, by and large, don't need to plant trees. There are some places where we could do something called enrichment planting. Let's say you do some forest management, some logging, you take out some timber, and you expect it to come back in oak, and it doesn't come back in enough oak. That might be a place for some planting. But otherwise, it's it's managing the forest that we need to do, not doing a lot of planting. How do you convince the average person or the average landowner that logging is not going to destroy the landscape of their land. 
that's a real problem. And, and what you do is you take them and show them. And that's why a lot of uh, the state universities that the land grant schools that have forestry programs have demonstration forests. Um, we have one, University of Kentucky has one in Eastern Kentucky called Robinson Forest, where uh, we do a, a variety of management techniques. And then we can bring landowners in there for workshops and, and show them how it works. We can bring landowners. We can also bring logging contractors and uh, timber management companies. We can bring all these people together and, and show them what's going on. I, I have to pause here and say, when I say we, I, I'm no longer at the University of Kentucky, but I was there for a long time. Tom Kimmerer earned his Ph.D. in forestry and botany from the University of Wisconsin and wrote the book Venerable Trees, History, Biology, and Conservation. He's working on his second book, A Time for Trees, and has been offering online lectures and classes through his website, Kimmerer.com. We've included a link in the show notes for this episode at WhiskeyCast.com. And that's Whiskey Cast in Depth, brought to you by Mortlock, whiskey's best kept secret. Hidden away for decades in some of the world's most famous Scotch whiskies, comes a single malt inspired by an original for a fortunate few. Discover the entire Mortlock lineup at malts.com. The one I'm tasting this week, Department, is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. I mentioned Waterford Distillery's open day this coming Saturday during the calendar of events, and I have now had the chance to taste the first four Waterford single malts that are on their way to the U.S., three from single farms and one using barley from six different farms. The idea is to explore the terroir that barley from a single farm can bring to a whiskey. All three of the single farm whiskeys use the same variety of barley, the same proportion of new American oak, ex-bourbon, French oak, and ex van de natural wine casks from France. And they're all bottled at 50% ABV, meaning the barley is the only difference. So, let's start off with the Waterford Dunmore 1.1 with barley from the Dunmore Farm in County Leash. The nose is aromatic with a great maltiness and an earthy hint of wet straw, Touches of cocoa powder, honey, and toffee, along with a hint of sawdust. The taste has a good balance of barley sugar and white pepper, with a touch of cardamom and hints of chocolate and honey that come out as the spices fade. Adding a little bit of water opens up a touch of dried fruits while giving the spices a nice kick. The finish, long and subtle with a lingering touch of spice. I'm scoring the Waterford Dunmore 1.1 a 92. Let's compare that to the Dunbell 1.1, which uses barley from the Dunbell farm in County Kilkenny. The nose here is malty with dried flowers, butterscotch, honeycomb, and a hint of lemon zest. The taste is well-rounded and full of flavor, with barley sugar, lemon pepper, butterscotch, honeycomb, and a hint of linseed oil. Water adds some more balance to this one, muting the spices while boosting the citrusy tartness. The finish is long and slightly dry with a subtle tartness. I'm scoring the Dunbell 1.1 a 91. More tasting notes in just a minute, but first, this week's tasting notes are brought to you by Sagamore Spirit Rye Whiskey. They'll be releasing the next batch of Penny's Proof soon. It's a preview of Sagamore Spirit Whiskey, distilled on site in Baltimore. Last year's first release of samples sold out in hours. The only way to find out when and how to get your hands on this year's batch is to join Sagamore Spirit's Whiskey Thieves. Sign up today at sagamorespirit.com. The third of the Waterford Single Farm Malts is the Rathclaw 1.1, with barley from the Rathclaw Farm in County Kilkenny. This one has a great maltiness on the nose with dried flowers, heather, honey, a subtle oakiness, and hints of red apples and apricots in the background. The taste has a honey and barley sugar sweetness, followed by a nice burst of spices, and just a hint of licorice, 
balanced by dried fruits and a touch of oak. In this case, adding some water boosts the fruity notes on the palate, and the finish is long, slightly dry with lingering spices, a hint of licorice, and a subtle hint of lemon zest. I'm scoring Waterford's Wrathclaw 1.1 1 .1, a 93. Finally, let's look at the Waterford Gale Organic from its Arcadian series. This one is the outlier. It uses organically grown barley from six different farms with the same recipe of casks and the same bottling strength as the single farm editions. The nose here is aromatic and very malty with figs, dates, plums, and hints of honey, vanilla, and butterscotch. The taste has an intense flavor. It's very malty with a barley sugar sweetness, hints of cinnamon, white pepper, and cardamom, dark fruits, honey, and butterscotch. Water brings out touches of citrus fruits and dried flowers, while the finish is very long, thick, and aromatic, with butterscotch, lingering spices, toasted oak, and a touch of grilled fruits. I'm scoring the Gaia Organic from Waterford Distillery a 92. So in conclusion, there are differences between the three single-farm whiskeys. They are subtle, but not minimal. But are they enough to define a difference in terroir between the farms? Well, with a sample size of only three different farms to work with so far, I'm not quite ready to make that call just yet. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. I'll be adding these tasting notes to our searchable list of more than 2,900 different whiskeys from all over the world. You'll find it at whiskeycast.com. Let's open up the inbox now for your voice. Last time around, we spent some time during the news discussing several stories involving criminal cases with whiskey industry connections. That brought this tweet from longtime listener Ken Goldenberg, at Ken from OC on Twitter. Holy moly, with so many indictments in the whiskey industry right now, maybe you should have preceded that part of your episode with the iconic bong-bong of Law & Order. Didn't even think of that idea at the time, Ken, but you're right. Hopefully, we won't have to use that very often. And remember, they're all innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. Let's face it, 2020 has been one of those years we would probably all like to forget. I joked the other day on Twitter whether it's possible to use a pressure washer to remove all memories of this year. Of course, that form of brainwashing is impossible and dangerous, so please don't try it. But a few people got the joke. Luke Seguin at OWG Luke in Ottawa, Ontario tweeted, There ain't enough pressure. A few folks also suggested what one of them called that flashy thing from Men in Black. But I have to give credit to Graham Cool of Ireland's Dingle Distillery for the best response. 2020, the year that should be chill-filtered. I mentioned Clay Risen's new $995 whiskey book that's coming out in October from his publisher at Ossoline, and after I tweeted about it this weekend, we had a couple of comments come in. Chris Ratcliffe tweeted from the UK. Does it come with two tiny copies of the book you can actually read while leaving the expensive one untouched? No. At Kentucky Spirits tweeted, It must come with a bottle of Pappy 15-year-old. Once again, no. And Greg Butler at Butler B. For $995, I can buy a lot of whiskey and write my own book. It may not sell, but I would have enjoyed many whiskeys. Now, I am just kidding, Clay, here. His whiskey books have always been excellent, and this one appears to be just a bit of over-exuberance from his publisher. I do not think he's the one who came up with this idea. If you have a question, a suggestion, a book review, or even just some idle speculation, well, you can always find us on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook at WhiskeyCast.com. 
The email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. Let's close out the show now with Behind the Label, our look at the history, science, and all that other stuff that combine to make whiskey unique. It's brought to you by Writer's Tears. Interesting question came up on Quora.com the other day that's worth explaining. How do websites such as Cask Cartel, Caskers, and Flaviar legally sell and ship liquor across state lines to consumers in the U.S.? What type of licensing do they require, and do they need licenses in every state they service? Well, there's a simple answer. It's complicated. It all depends on just which state an e-retailer is based in, since there are some states that don't have any restrictions on shipping distilled spirits out of state, and others that don't allow it either in-state or out of state. Others only allow it to states that offer reciprocal shipping privileges to residents in their states. For instance, Kentucky's new law that took effect last month but won't really be implemented until later this year when the regulations are in place, it only allows direct shipments from distilleries to residents of about 10 states that allow shipments from their states to Kentucky residents. Not every state requires out-of-state retailers to get a license to ship to consumers in their states, but many do. For instance, Illinois is one of the states that not only requires out-of-state retailers to get a license to ship to Illinois residents, but requires them to collect all of the Illinois state taxes on the state's behalf. Then again, there are the control states like Pennsylvania, where a state agency acts as either the exclusive wholesaler or the retailer, or in Pennsylvania's case, both, and does not allow shipments of spirits to its residents from outside the state. As I said, it is complicated. Not all retailers can ship to all states, or even a majority of them. And technically, online retailers located in other countries can't ship directly to consumers in the U.S. What they generally do is work with a licensed importer and retailer, and send shipments for multiple consumers in one large package. Then their U.S. agents break those down into packages for each individual customer to send via FedEx or UPS. It really is complicated, and the COVID-19 pandemic has forced a number of states to change their rules on shipments of spirits this year, so no one is really quite sure what the landscape is going to look like for online whiskey buying a year from now. If you have something you'd like us to look at on an upcoming episode, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. Behind the Label is brought to you by Writer's Tears. Writer's Tears Copper Pot, a unique triple distilled premium Irish whiskey combining single malt and single pot still. First fashioned in the 1700s and still a rarity today. Sure, as we say in Ireland, what's rare is wonderful. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. That's all for this edition of Whiskey Cast. You'll find links for the stories in this episode in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you'll find the latest whiskey news, my tasting notes, the calendar of events, our whiskey photo of the week, and of course, a complete archive of all of our past episodes all the way back to 2005. We love to hear from you. Get in touch with us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. When you land on something special, you just know. Redbreast, the quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey and a proud sponsor of WhiskeyCast. WhiskeyCast is a production of Cast Strength Media, copyright 2020, and comes to you from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening, and please stay safe.